Our next topic here is Alaskan halibut and the race to fish. So this is a story from the 1960s. The United States then and now regulates ocean fishing off the coast of the U.S. by breaking the coast up into segments of a few hundred miles each and setting up fisheries management councils to regulate fishing in each one of these segments. And one of these segments is off the coast of Alaska. This is the coast of Alaska that's around Anchorage, so a few hundred miles um, around, uh, around Anchorage. And the hal halibut is an important um, uh, f f fish that, that people eat. It's a bottom-dwelling fish, a demersal fish. But before the 1960s, most Alaskan fishing was for Alaskan consumption. You didn't have the technology yet to freeze fish in Alaska and transport them to the U.S. or even less so to fly fresh fish from Alaska to the U.S. But that te both of these technologies began to develop. And as they began to develop, it became more and more profitable to fish for Alaskan halibut. And as a res response, there was more fishing pressure put on Alaskan halibut. Effort in the industry started to increase. The regulators at this time were not trained in economics. They were biologists. And the method of regulation that they use is the method of regulation that biologists use in many different areas. For example, when you hunt deer in Utah, we have a deer hunting season. And if the biologists think that we want more deer to be hunted, they'll, they can extend the season. And if biologists think there should be fewer deer hunted, then they can shorten the season. And so this method is called season length regulation. Is what was used and what is still used today by biologists in lots of different situations. So biologists started to get worried about the viability of Alaskan halibut and began to shorten the length of the season. What the fishing firms did in response was to increase the intensity of fishing effort. So they would uh, wouldn't take off, wouldn't take many days off. They would fish more often, fish for more hours. Could also use larger nets, bigger boats, hire more crew. So in other words, fishing effort increased, and the biologists found that reducing the season length didn't work because there were still uh, too many halibut being caught. And so the regulators responded by shortening the season length even more. But then the industry responded by increasing the intensity of fishing effort even more. And so the managers saw that their decrease in season length didn't work, so they decreased the season length even further. So you got a vicious cycle of decreasing season length, which induced the industry to increase fishing effort intensity, which induced the regulators to decrease season length yet more, until finally, it got to the point where the entire annual season length for catching halibut off, the, off this part of Alaska's coast was one 24-hour period. That is one 24-hour period in the entire year. Now you can imagine what that 24-hour period was like. During that time, none of the fishermen got any sleep every single f fishing vessel that could at all be used to catch halibut was pressed into the effort of catching halibut. It's an incredible amount of fishing effort. There were accidents that happened. Um, one boat's nets got tangled up with other boat's nets. There were collisions. It was quite dangerous. You know, The crews were awake for a lot more than 24 hours because they had to get ready for this period first and then they had to finish things up after the 24 hours were over. So you have exhausted crews 
and none of the fish were able to be sold fresh, almost none. You had to freeze just about everything because you had it all coming in at once. Whereas you know, by this point, they could have sold some fresh fish on, you know, sh shipped them on airplanes to the so-called lower 48 states uh, if, uh, if they weren't catching the entire year's um, amount of fish in 24 hours. Now, fishermen tend to be quite wary of change. They're often not making a lot of money, and they're worried that if you change the regulatory mechanism, that might cause them to, to lose money or, or go, go bankrupt. But at this point, the situation had become so, in some sense, ridiculous that even they decided to investigate alternatives. And economists suggested here uh, individual transferable quotas. Individual transferable quotas are exactly the same thing as cap and trade or tradable permits, except that the cap and trade and tradable permits terms are used in environmental economics and individual transferable quotas or ITQs are used in fisheries economics. But the idea is the government sets a quota, usually uses grandfathering, and in this case in Alaska they use grandfathering to distribute the permits. And then there was no season, you could catch the fish whenever you wanted. And this turned out to be quite a success. Fishing costs went down drastically. You didn't have to have such large boats, uh, so much equipment, so much manpower. Uh, it became possible to fish when the weather was good and not fish when the weather was bad. You could you could stay in. So it worked out quite nicely both for the fish stock, that is from an environmental point of view, but also for the fishing industry. They could now they could uh, they didn't have to freeze everything that they caught. They could uh, they could put fresh fish on airplanes and sell them in the in the other states of the US and fresh fish brings more money than frozen fish so revenues went up costs went down it was success really all the way around our next topic brine shrimp so this is a utah topic there was a commercial fishery in Utah in the 19th century, in Utah Lake, but it was overexploited, and it, um, by, I think, the 1890s, it didn't exist anymore. The only commercial fishery in Utah today is, the, oh, and by the way, the state is trying to clean up Utah Lake, trying to remove carp. Carp are, are non-native fish that were introduced into Utah Lake in the early 20th century. The state of Utah is now trying to get rid of the carp so you can reintroduce native fish, which can't exist uh, in the environment that the carp has created. And so they're attempting to rejuvenate that, but it's a very difficult uh, task. So the only uh, commercial fishery that exists now in Utah is brine shrimp. Now, brine shrimp are not fish, they're crustaceans. People don't eat brine shrimp. Brine shrimp are way too small. The brine shrimp population completely dies every November and December. And during the coldest month of the year, in January and February, there are no living brine shrimp in the Great Salt Lake. But before they die, the brine shrimp reproduce with uh, eggs. And these eggs are extremely hardy. They can withstand very cold water and a highly saline environment that's in the Great Salt Lake. And then when the weather warms up, then the eggs hatch and they create the next year's population of brine shrimp. Now, people don't eat brine shrimp, but brine shrimp are used in aquaculture in the following way. Some aquaculture, particularly aquaculture in tropical countries like in South America and in Southeast Asia, is aquaculture to raise uh, shrimp that people eat. You might call them prawns, much, much bigger than brine shrimp. But some species of prawns only eat live prey. So you can't feed them you know, cornmeal or something like that. 
And the question is, how do you feed these prawns live prey when the prawns themselves have just hatched and so they're pretty small? Well, it turns out that brine shrimp are a great answer to that question. So when the prawns are pretty small, they need prey that's even smaller than they are. But if you have dried brine shrimp eggs from the Great Salt Lake in, in cans, you can just open a can, dump the can in the water, the brine shrimp will hatch, and then the prawns can eat the brine shrimp. And this is the idea behind a multi-million dollar industry now in Utah of removing the brine shrimp eggs from the Great Salt Lake during mostly December and January, and sometimes in November as well. You dry the eggs, put them in cans, sell them all around the world for uh, to, to firms that are engaged in aquaculture, and um, and they use them as I as I just described. But just as we've seen in other cases, if you have an open access situation, there's a problem with over exploitation, with you know going over to to levels of effort that are too large. The state of Utah regulates the brine shrimp industry using season length regulation because the regulators are biologists and that's what they know. And the result of the season length regulation for the brine shrimp industry has been the same as the result the season length regulation had for the Alaskan halibut industry. Over roughly the last 15 years, it's become much more difficult to be a brine shrimp fisherman. It used to be that you didn't need a large boat, that they only fished maybe half the days of the week, and you can make a very nice uh, living uh, getting the brine shrimp eggs in November, December, and January. But that's not true anymore. Now the small Utah firms that characterized the industry in the 1990s have been largely replaced by much larger firms some of them multinational firms. I believe the largest brine shrimp uh, firm right now is based in the Netherlands. So it's European. The way the industry works, so you have a certain season length and every firm gets a buoy. And each buoy corresponds to one what's called certificate of registration. So I think there's 79, something like 79 certificates of registration. And these are distributed among the firms. And, uh, and, and each one gives you the right to put a buoy in the water. And when you put the, when you, so when the firm, when, when a fishing vessel sees the eggs floating on the top of the, of the water, they put the buoy down and that gives them exclusive rights to catch any eggs within a certain number, certain number of hundreds of feet around that buoy. But now that there's so much fishing effort, it's become a race to fish, just like it was in Alaska. The idea is you want, once your buoy hits the water, you only have one buoy. And so once the buoy hits the water, you can't get eggs anywhere else. So you want to try to get the eggs off of the lake surface as quickly as possible so you can take the buoy out and go to the next place. Now there are actually uh, pilots that fly in spotter aircraft hired by the each uh, brine shrimp firm. They fly around the Great Salt Lake and when the pilot sees eggs floating on the surface of the lake, the pilot radios to a speedboat. The speedboat has a buoy and the speedboat rushes to where the pilot found the eggs, and if they're the first ones, if some other pilot hadn't uh, hasn't uh, radioed to some other speedboat first, then 
then the first speedboat to get there puts the buoy down and gets gets those eggs. But of course, you want to get the harvesting boat there as quickly as possible so you can harvest quickly. So now you need not only spotting aircraft at speedboats, but you need harvesting boats that have pretty powerful motors so they're not slow, they can go things they can go there quickly. You, they should have large uh, nets in order to get the eggs quickly. So it's it's become much more expensive than it was in the 1990s to be a brine shrimp fisherman. Uh, the result has been that there's a lot of consolidation in the industry. Um, profits are lower, you know, uh, earlier used to have a lot of profits, total revenue was much larger than total cost, but as effort increases that gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so profit starts disappearing and that's what's happened. There's been a lot of consolidation. A uh, PhD student of mine, uh, more than 10 years ago now, uh, wrote a dissertation in which he predicted these things and suggested to the industry that it switch to an individual transferable quota scheme. And some of the firms were interested in it, but other firms were wary. They weren't familiar with ITQs and they were scared that a new regulatory system was going to make profits harder to earn rather than easier to earn. So right now, nothing's been done. The state still uses season length regulation, and profits in the brine shrimp industry have have fallen quite a bit. We'll continue with uh, stories in the next video.